When I was much younger, I remember going to this one metal concert. It was a tiny venue with no more than like 50 kids there. One of the bands that was playing was this local Christian metal band. And I remember the vocalist getting up on stage, grabbing the microphone, and he said, I just want you guys to know that Jesus Christ is Lord and nobody else is. And if you don't like what I'm saying, you can pull the trigger because I know where I'm going. And the kid was met with roaring applause. And even back then, I couldn't help but find the whole thing a little bit funny because we were at a Christian venue, Plop Square in the middle of the Bible Belt, and probably every single kid in that room was a Christian. <sighs> that story has always been funny to me, and I think that it highlights the youthful, ambitious zeal that most of us have had at one point or another. But I think it serves to highlight the often disconnected and sometimes naive understanding that we have of martyrdom. For most of the world, martyrdom and physical persecution are matters of history. They were something that happened back then. We don't have many analogs to ancient Christian martyrdom today. There's a naivety in thinking that it would be straightforward or easy to stand one's ground in one of these do or die moments. But it's probably much more naive of us to think that there's an obvious right answer as far as what to do in one of these situations. History tells us that many of the stories of the martyrs were in actuality a lot more complicated than we might want to imagine. And that is exactly why they are all the more deserving of our attention. One of the most gut-wrenching episodes of martyrdom in church history comes to us from Carthage in North Africa. The year was 203. At the time, Carthage was under the domain of the Roman Empire. Now, Christian persecution wasn't a constant in the ancient world. It often came in waves. Who the emperor was at the time often had a direct correlation to the severity and rigor with which the Romans sought to stomp out the underground Christian movement. During this time, two very unlikely people were imprisoned for having joined the sect of Christianity. Their names were Perpetua and Felicitas. Perpetua was an affluent young woman and a new mother. Felicitas, on the other hand, was also a young woman in her early 20s, but she was actually pregnant during the time of her imprisonment. The account that we have of their martyrdom is extraordinary, not only because of the disturbing insanity of it, but because of how the story comes down to us. The martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicitas is comprised primarily of Perpetua's prison diary. There's also an introductory statement and an epilogue written by an anonymous editor, but the bulk of the document is written from the first-person perspective of Perpetua herself, or at least it presents itself as such. As with all things in antiquity, the authenticity of the letter is contested. But if this letter is authentic, then it's astonishingly important, because it would mean that this is among the oldest letters in history that we know to have been penned by a woman. The story gives us an interesting glimpse into some of the more unsettling complications that can arise when standing up for what a person believes in. It's easy to think that we would be cavalier and ambitious if we were in this kind of do or die situation. But the passion of Perpetua and Felicitas is a sobering reminder that in many of these situations, being courageous is often more complicated than we perceive. The martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicitas begins with the two women inside their prison cell. The Romans had exhausted every threat at their disposal. The last and final solution was execution. These two young women sat in prison and awaited their end. Perpetua recounts that while she was in prison, her father came and visited on multiple occasions and pleaded with her to recant her faith. The Romans didn't have any interest in killing loyal citizens. All Perpetua needed to do was renounce Christ, make a small sacrifice to the emperor, and pledge her allegiance to Rome. If she did that, she could go free. Perpetua's father became understandably distraught. In one of his many visits, he threw himself up against the bars of Perpetua's prison cell, and in a rage of hysteria, began yelling at her. He did so while holding Perpetua's baby, the baby that she was still nursing. He said to her through tears, think of your brothers, think of your mother and your aunt, think of your child who will not be able to live once you are gone. Give up your pride. You will destroy all of us. The prison guards in reaction to the old man's act of impropriety beat him in front of his daughter Perpetua. And somehow 
through all of this, Perpetua's resolve was unshaken. Keep in mind that through all of this, according to the document, Perpetua is only 22 years old. When people think of martyrdom, they often imagine the ramifications of the martyrs' decisions only affecting the martyrs themselves. But in actuality, that's rarely the case, and it especially wasn't the case for Perpetua and Felicitas. By refusing to recant, the young women were not only bringing death upon themselves, but it would also mean that they were leaving behind and forfeiting their children. It's easy for us to think, oh, I would absolutely walk with my head held high to the gallows to stand up for what I believe in. But what if it meant suffering for someone else? What if it meant that your son had to grow up without a mother? What if your faithful stance caused the lifelong anguish of a child having to grow up without a parent? gets more convoluted from here. As mentioned previously, Felicitas was pregnant during the time of her imprisonment. Now, this obviously wasn't good, but it's interesting to note why this was so problematic to Felicitas. At that time, Roman law stated that it was illegal to sentence to death any pregnant woman. The baby was seen as property in part or in whole of either the child's father or the woman's slave master. What this meant for Felicitas was that her execution date would be postponed until after the death of her child. The reason why this was so upsetting to Felicitas was that she wanted to be executed alongside her fellow Christians. If her execution was to be postponed, she wouldn't be martyred alongside Perpetua and the others, but instead she would be executed alongside a new batch of inmates should be put to death alongside common criminals. Felicitas's response to this might seem a little off-putting. Rather than pray to be somehow acquitted or to be miraculously set free, Felicitas instead prayed for a premature birth. And her prayer was answered. Felicitas gave birth after only eight months of pregnancy. And she did so inside of a cold, dark prison cell so that she could die alongside her fellow martyrs. This sounds incredibly bleak, and it was. But to portray the story as only macabre would be inaccurate. What's astounding is the attitude and demeanor of Perpetua and the other Christians while they were still in prison. During the time in her jail cell, Perpetua had a series of visions. Visions of Christ, visions of heaven, visions of her deceased brother, all of which she describes in breathtaking detail in her diary. Those visions were so meaningful and euphoric to her that she wrote down in her diary that her jail cell became to her like a palace and that she had not the slightest desire to leave. What's more is that Perpetua's visions galvanized her resolve. The visions proved to Perpetua that there was a spiritual reality underlying the physical events that were unfolding around her. In one of these visions, she sees herself ascending up a ladder, surrounded by all sorts of metal weapons, swords, spears, hooks, and daggers. And then she notices, at the bottom of the ladder underneath her, an enormous dragon. In the vision, she looks to one of her Christian companions and says, in the name of Jesus Christ, he will not hurt me. Then she shoves her heel 
onto the skull of the dragon, using its head as the first rung of the ladder into heaven. The Romans were good at nothing, if not torture. Now, in actuality, there were likely far fewer Christian martyrs in the ancient world than a casual observer might imagine. But for those who were martyred, the Romans relished in devising cruel and unusual tortures for them. For Perpetua, Felicitas, and the handful of Christians they were imprisoned with, the Romans decided that they would be thrown into an amphitheater to be mauled to death by wild animals in front of a jeering crowd. It's at this point in the story where Perpetua is no longer the one narrating, but instead an anonymous editor recounts the details of her execution. What's both beautiful and unsettling is the language with which the editor depicts the day of the martyr's execution. He describes that day saying, quote, the day of their victory dawned. It feels haunting, subversive. Lynn Kohick, one of the leading scholars of Christian women in the anti-Nicene era, points out how rare it would have been to see a woman in a gladiatorial match like this. But even taking into account the sex of Perpetua and Felicitas, this was a scene that the crowds were not prepared for. The martyrs walked out into the amphitheater, ready to be slaughtered, and the editor says that they did so with joy inexpressible on their faces. Felicitas, in particular, having only given birth just prior, walked out into the amphitheater with her breasts still dripping from childbirth. Ancient Christianity, the sacrament of baptism, played a far more dominant role than it does today. The idea was that the act of baptism was the literal act of washing away one's previous sins. So it was of paramount importance. But martyrdom played an interesting role in the discussion on baptism. Some early Christian thinkers asked the question, what if a Christian died as a martyr for the cause of Christ before ever having been baptized. The answer which gained some traction in the theological community was that if a martyr died for the cause of Christ, the blood that they spilled during their execution becomes the water of their baptism. And for those martyrs who had already been baptized, they simply received the honor of being baptized a second time. This was doubly pertinent to Felicitas, who had only just recently given birth. The editor writes of her saying, quote, With them also was Felicitas, glad that she had safely given birth so that now she could fight the beasts, going from one bloodbath to another, from the midwife to the gladiator, ready to wash after childbirth in a second baptism. were released into the amphitheater, and one by one, the martyrs were struck down. Perpetua's companions were bitten by a leopard, maimed by a bear, and bludgeoned by a wild boar, all in addition to being hacked to pieces by the gladiators. As for Perpetua and Felicitas, the Romans prepared an aggravated heifer, a literal mad cow, to charge at the young women. The cow darted towards Perpetua, and she took a direct blow, center mass from the animal. The impact thrashed her onto the ground, but Perpetua, according to the document, was unfazed. He writes that for the duration of her time in the amphitheater, Perpetua was caught up in a trance. She was fixated on the heavenly bliss that she was about to enjoy and engulfed in divine ecstasy. 
She stood to her feet confused and asked, when are we going to be thrown to that heifer or whatever it is? She was so consumed in divine euphoria that she sincerely didn't realize that she had been badly attacked. Perpetua looked to her fellow Christians, all of whom at this point were either dead or dying and drenched in their own blood. She grants the ones that were still alive a final kiss of peace, a common custom in the ancient church. Now at this point, she turns and sees one of the guards who had treated her and the other Christians with a level of favor. He was so dumbfounded by Perpetua's courage and faith that he himself was on the cusp of conversion. Perpetua looked to him and said, quote, Goodbye. Remember me and remember the faith. These things should not disturb you, but rather strengthen you. Immediately afterwards, a gladiator approached her to finish her off. According to the document, the gladiator raised his sword and swung it at Perpetua's neck. She screamed in pain and the sword struck a bone but it didn't kill her. The gladiator was a young and inexperienced killer. Finally, in an act of incomprehensible defiance, Perpetua grabs the hands of the young gladiator and guides his sword to her throat, as if to say, you can only kill me if I give you permission. <laughs> and there, Perpetua died. about the perspectives of Perpetua and Felicitas's children in all of this. What did they think of their mother's martyrdoms growing up? Unfortunately, history has not given us their stories. We have no record of how those kids turned out. But there are several different possible outcomes in all of this. It's possible that the children grew up in the Christian community, being told of their mother's heroism and the stance they took for their beliefs. It's very possible that those young children looked upon their late mothers with pride as heroes of the faith. But it might be too easy for us to just assume that. I think that if we're to wrestle with this story, we have to realize that Perpetua and Felicitas had no guarantee about how their deaths would affect their children. To quickly assume the best happened to their children is to brush off the struggle that Perpetua and Felicitas faced when confronted with the prospect of martyrdom. We have no guarantees. We don't even know that their children grew up to be believers at all. If we're to take the story seriously, then we have to equally consider the possibility that the children grew up resenting, even hating their mothers. You can imagine a scenario in which they might say, oh, my mother abandoned me because she got herself sucked into a cult and got herself senselessly killed, all for some stupid superstitious myth. What if the martyr's act of faith was the very thing that destroyed the faith of their children? We don't know. Could it have been possible that Perpetua and Felicitas wrestled with the uncertainty of that question themselves? Maybe, but we don't know. But now this is where things get interesting. Let's imagine that Perpetua and Felicitas had recanted, that they actively rejected Christ in front of the Romans, made a sacrifice of goodwill to the emperor, and went on to live normal, peaceful lives as civil citizens. I can imagine that many atheists or non-believers may hear this story and wish that that had been the course of action these young mothers would have taken. 
But even from a non-religious, naturalistic perspective, it's not at all clear that this would have been the best course of action. If Perpetua and Felicitas had recanted, what would their children have thought about that? Would they have been grateful that their mothers had prioritized them over this symbolic act of religious liberty? Maybe, but we don't know. You could just as easily imagine a scenario in which Perpetua and Felicitas lived out the rest of their lives in a fog of shame and guilt and depression, with their children growing up looking upon their mothers with resentment, disgusted by their cowardice and complicity. But again, we don't know. And ultimately, neither did Perpetua and Felicitas, and that is what is so terrifying about their situation. They had no idea what the outcome of all of this would be. They had no guarantee that their children would be all right. They had no promise that their souls wouldn't suffer because of their decision. There isn't a lot of certainty in this story, but there is at least one thing that we can be fairly certain of. And that is that these children, whatever they thought of their mother's deaths growing up, ultimately still had to grow up without their mothers. And as with any person who loses a parent, they miss them. Perpetua and Felicitas are only faintly remembered by today's Christians, but for much of church history they were venerated and revered as martyrs for Christ. St. Augustine, in a sermon of his, records a beautiful irony of the two young mothers. He said, quote, God's holy servants, Perpetua and Felicitas, adorned with the garlands of martyrdom, burst into bloom in perpetual felicity holding on to the name of Christ in the war, and at the same time also, finding their own names in the reward. It's poetic, isn't it? Perpetua and Felicitas found their own namesakes, perpetual felicity, eternal joy, as the reward for their act of faith in martyrdom. I hope you all liked this video. If you did, please consider subscribing and supporting me on Patreon so that I can make more videos like this. There are many more stories to be told.